Okay, good afternoon. Um, my name is Charlie Kenny, and this is the Center for the Americas seminar. Um, today, we're pleased to um, have as our guest uh, Victor Make, who uh, is both part of the university uh, through the um, Department of History, uh, but also uh, is the managing director of the Latin American Sustainability Initiative. Uh, for those of you who are joining us, uh, we have chosen to run this meeting as a regular meeting, uh, which means that um, you can uh, log in and, and with your cameras if you wish. Uh, and when it comes time to ask questions and such, uh, you can uh, speak directly uh, using your microphone uh, or, or raise your hand uh, to be recognized if you wish. Um, you can also uh, write questions in the chat if you wish. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you prefer to place a written question, do that through the chat. And um, otherwise, we'll try to manage this as if, as if we were sitting in a room together, which is what we hope to be doing before uh, too long. Um, uh, Victor Maque, our, our, our guest, is an historian of Latin America, um, and he has studied for many years, particularly the ways that indigenous communities and popular sectors of the Southern American Andes, the Andes of Peru and, and Bolivia, um, have struggled and uh, transformed their views and practices in the realms of politics, culture, and the environment um, while um, maintaining their place in the world. Um, Victor uh, studied at universities in Peru, his uh, native country. He uh, received his doctorate from the University of Notre Dame. And he's, over the years, had the opportunity to teach and guide students in Latin America and in the United States. He's developed study abroad programs, uh, worked in the classroom, etc and uh, is presently an affiliated faculty member of the OU Department of History. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, he's also the Managing Director of the Latin American Sustainability Initiative, LASI, in OU's Office of the Vice President for Research and Partnership. In this capacity, Victor collaborates with faculty across OU uh, who have an interest in being part of multidisciplinary and international research teams focused on tackling some of the larger problems uh, that face our world and our societies um, at the intersection of global change, the environment, uh, and human health for resilient societies in the region of Latin America. Um, Victor uh, has um, done research and, and written on the topic he will be addressing today, um, the struggles uh, for autonomy on the part of indigenous communities in Bolivia and Peru uh, at the time of Latin America's independence from Spain. So uh, please join me in, in welcoming Victor Maque to the Center for the Americas, and uh, we look forward to hearing your presentation, Victor. Hey, Charlie. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for such a kind introduction. I hope you can see the, my screen that I'm sharing now. Uh, yes, I can. I hope everyone else can. Excellent. Well, uh, again, thank you, Charlie, for uh, you know for your kind invitation, and uh, also for your leadership for on the Center for the Americas. Uh, and also thank you, uh, Stephanie, Stephanie Sager, who uh, kindly have uh, helped us to uh, establish the connections and guide us to with the logistics for this uh, conversation. <clears throat> and to you all for, for your, allowing me your time this afternoon. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to say that, uh, please forgive me for inflicting on you this presentation uh, that is still a raw enunciation of some ideas in my attempt to contribute uh, my one cent uh, to current discussions about bicentennial of independence of Andean countries uh, in South America from what was known the Spanish uh, colonialism, particularly Bolivia's bicentennial coming up, it will be remembered in 2025. Mm -hmm. 
I intend to follow uh, briefly this uh, three, three points. An introduction to give you a little background. Uh, and my second point is community struggles in the Andean Altiplano to show you some of the cases I've, I examined and a few ideas as a manner of conclusion. So the independence process in my, in my first point, an independence process of, of a country it's always much more complex than a single event and a proclamation of a document by a group of men often regarded as the, the founding fathers, right? I think nowhere in the world, this process is more convoluted than in Latin America, where even the colonizing structure is largely discussed as not quite colonial, that is, a central power in the metropolis ruling a colony overseas. Instead, the viceroys of New Spain, what was called, uh, what was in Mexico and Guatemala region now, and uh, viceroyalty of Peru, were often perceived as autonomous uh, rulers with greater wealth and power than the Spanish monarch in himself. During most of the colonial era, there's a, in Spanish America, the rule of the law was obedezco, pero no cumplo, right? I obey, but I do not comply. Whenever an inconvenient decree was received from the Spanish crown. Furthermore, the long colonial era was not always homogeneous. It twisted and turned often dramatically in, the, in those over 300 years of uh, colonial uh, control. And the powers in, uh, the, in the Spanish America also changed. The late colonial Andes, uh, starting in the 1700s and on to 1800, early 1800s, 1810s and 20s, was an era of tremendous changes, mostly characterized by what is called, uh, what was called the Bourbon reforms and the age of Andean insurrections. As you all, uh, many might know, the, the big change in the powers of the, color, the Spanish uh, uh, rule was the French Bourbon house coming, uh, taking over the Spanish crown in early 1700s. The Bourbon house, the rulers implemented a regime of enlightened absolutism, uh, primarily concentrating on three aspects, extreme fiscal pressure to extract as much revenue as possible from the colonies. Second, undermining the power and wealth of the church. As you all know, the Catholic church uh, was a powerful institution to all the, the, colon uh, the colony. Uh, amassed a great wealth in uh, houses and uh, property and had uh, powerful influence all over the place. And uh, one of those were, for instance, the Jesuits, who from the beginning of the colonial period have uh, amassed a great power and influence, uh, both in, uh, at the church level and, and the colonial government level. And they were, for instance, uh, you know, uh, taken out from the colonial uh, uh, presence in, in the Spanish America and uh, during this time of the Bourbon reforms. Uh, the, the other parts of the Bourbon reforms were also a fundamental uh, to describe the, the change was the primacy that the, the Bourbons provided to the peninsular elites, meaning the Spaniards born in the peninsula of Spain uh, on top of the Criollo or Spanish uh, born in the Americas, who previously had access to the higher offices in, in the colonial uh, uh, administration. And now, now with the Bourbon reforms, the peninsulares, the, those born in the, in the peninsula, had uh, were the, pri the primary who had access to those higher offices and the control of the uh, of the colonies. 
For the Andean communities, this translated into a ruthless imposition of demands for uh, more tribute, labor, and uh, in way of meta or corvi labor, you know, bringing people uh, into the soul wrenching uh, shafts of the mines throughout the region, particularly in the Andes in Potosi, in what is now southern Bolivia. This ruthless push for more revenues at all levels of the colonial power was often called as the second conquest of America by David Brady, a historian of, of Mexico, that generated increase in unrest, resistance, and eventually full-fledged insurrections. These insurrections were, uh, were known as the age of the Andean insurrections. And from mid 1700s to 1815, historians have documented at least 100 and 115 insurrectionary movements, big and small, including the massive rebellions of Tomas Catari on what is now Bolivia, Tupac Amaro on uh, where is now Cusco in the southern Peru, and uh, Tomas Catari in the re region of uh, La Paz, the, the capital area of Bolivia. These uprisings in the 1780s and 81 shook the entire Spanish America to its core. However, along these insurrections during violent times, and even more intensely uh, in quote unquote normal times, and the end communities waged war on their adversaries before the colonial courts. Native communities mobilized collectively led by a host of secondary figures and, and Indios del Común or co uh, common Indians, rather than being led by traditional na native leaders such as the caciques. On the contrary, the caciques along the other colonial officials such as priests, intendants or corregidores and uh, other colonial elites were often identified as the enemy against which the community mobilized in a mass. These community level struggles and conscious political engagement were mostly ignored by scholars until fairly recently. The approach that examines these processes, the social history or history from below, questions former narratives that have primarily focused on the lead sector's role in the big events, the so-called great, great historical moments. Seems like oh, <clears throat> my uh, slides were stuck for a moment. So my second point, community struggles in the Andean Altiplano. In this presentation, I'd like to argue, along with other scholars, that a gradual transformation of indigenous politics in mid 18th century was a fundamental factor in the long and complex process of independence of the Andean countries. I, fact, I focus today primarily in one, in one of the regions and the communities located in the Altiplano, the high plateau, as you can see in the map uh, located between what is now the uh, border of Bolivia and Peru. In the same decades of the massive insurrections breaking out across the region, these indigenous communities maintained unrelenting battles before the colonial courts literally dragging their foes indigenous and non-indigenous before the distant colonial courts. The real audiencias of Charcas uh, in the central part of Bolivia, Lima and the coast of Peru, and Buenos Aires way at the other side of, of the continent. While the cases they pursued might appear village level disputes, closely examined, these were struggles for regional Andean and autonomy and self-rule. These were not simply unrest with episodic revolts or everyday forms of peasant resistance, as James Scott argued in, in his excellent book, uh, Weapons of the Week. I will attempt to show you that these were consistent community level movements that showed conscious political engagement that sought to advance local agendas, such as defense of community resources, possessions, and perceived rise to self-rule. Ultimately, they fought for their place in the world. 
during most of the colonial period, the indigenous communities in the Andes have been primarily led by and represented by the cacique, the ethnic lord, an almost mythic figure perceived as having religious and political powers, perceived as even dueños de indios, the owners of the lives of the Indians, as Susan Ramirez uh, wrote in early colonial times. Caciques' transit from traditional ethnic leadership to becoming colonial agents, brokers, and increasingly at odds with their communities have been carefully documented and traced by many historians, chief among them, uh, David Cahill, uh, historian teaching in Australia. Most scholars examine the, traje the trajectory of uh, and political agency of caciques have equated it with the political agency of the native communities in the Andes. Therefore, many have concluded that when caciques were erased at the end of the colonial state, the political agency of their communities have been decapitated. I contend that arguing that the erosion and decline of the cacique happens a lot earlier, a good mid-century earlier, and that the fundamental factor was the native communities pulling the plug on the caciques. Communities engaged in, pol in politics collectively and identified caciques as one more enemy of their community and gradually sought to replace them with a diverse cadre of mainly secondary figures, more plebe plebeian figures, as opposed to the more aristocratic air that caciques gave to themselves. This then allow me to, will allow me to show that the political agency of native communities in the Altiplano were not decapitated. On the contrary, it was transformed from within, allowing diverse outcomes with communities engaged directly in the defense and the struggles of their possession, resources, and local governance systems. The late colonial Altiplano communities experiencing mounting pressure for revenue, the attribute, meta, and two more, the most resented uh, impositions were called uh, reparto de mercancías, which was uh, literally a forced distribution of goods by the corregidor or the intendant with the Spanish magistrates in, in the, of the particular region to uh, prices high, uh, as high as possible to get the most revenue from them. They responded with organized resistance in and around the courts using the legal system in place to defend themselves. The second aspect of the, the most resented among the communities was the encroachment of community lands by local elites, some Spanish officials, and some caciques themselves. Community members consistently identify local elites, Spaniards, Criollos, and caciques as their primary aggressors and collectively organized to respond. Around mid 18th century, that is 1750s and on, communities often started their defense with their caciques uh, uh, at front. Large group of community members traveled alongside the cacique uh, to the community, to the colonial centers in order to voice out their accusations before the authorities and, and the local elites. This mass mobilization were soon banned and became clandestine actions, traveling at night, avoiding local authorities and bringing their case before the higher courts in faraway colonial centers. In the process, however, repeatedly, caciques became the source of contention by compromising themselves with the magistrates or with the very enemies they were supposed to defend the community from. Caciques often join local elite groups, as Steve Stern called the power groups, that exploited indigenous communities. The communities faced with their own caciques shifting sides, or worse, realizing that the caciques themselves were taking advantage of them, they, were not, they did not remain as passive victims. On the contrary, 
They transformed the politics by confronting their caciques and reorganizing their struggles, replacing the caciques with previously secondary and even ordinary community members. To illustrate, I would like to show you a, a couple of cases, three cases uh, that comes from these uh, sources, my primary sources, as you can see in the, in the image, these are the type of uh, sources that we uh, go and, and study and examine uh, in this regional and national collection, uh, historical archives. In my first case, in 1754, Atanasio Cachicatari, cacique of Anansaya, had been litigating against the priest, Pedro Marquez. Cachicatari and his assistant had denounced the priest before the ecclesial court in uh, the city of La Paz, about two, three days travel uh, on, on foot from their communities accusing Mar uh, Marcus, the priest, of being an abusive oppressor. They traveled to La Paz and stayed at the house of a lawyer who was a friend of the cacique and helped them to present this, his, their complaint. The court issued a notification for the priest that the cacique himself offered to deliver to the corregidor of Tiahuanaco. But it turned out that the priest was a good friend of the corregidor, the Spanish magistrate. In, of the region. So the corregidor and the priest convinced the cacique to stay with them in town for two more weeks and made him change his mind. The community soon realized what was going on. They saw that the corregidor ignored the court order and the priest continued as if nothing had happened. Pressured by the community, the cacique confessed that he had received 200 pesos from them to keep quiet. He promised that he will return the money, but asked the community to withdraw the complaint against the priest because his position was at stake. However, Sebastian Calisaya, who was his assistant before, uh, along with other community members, did not do what the cacique asked for them to do. On the contrary, they decided to continue the complaint and included the cacique as, as one more to, to fight against. Calisaya and a group of community members returned to the city of La Paz. And soon after, they found out that the neighboring community of Urinsaya, also from the same area, was presenting a complaint against the same priest and the cacique of that community, Don Pedro Limach. In the following months, uh, about six months later, the documents show that both communities have joined forces in one, uh, and followed as one case, accusing the corregidor of cor corruption and abusing them. They indicated that the priest Marcus made abusive demands, whipped them and threatened them with excommunication. In a following letter, uh, the, the community said, Nuestro cacique nos ha abandonado. Ya no es nuestro, ha sido corrompido y es adicto al cura. Our cacique has abandoned us. He is no longer ours. He has been corrupted and is a an henchman of the priest. And my second case, in 1806, I, as you can see here in the document and the image, Vicente Paricagua, Isidro Apaza, Diego Paricagua, Joaquin Mamani, and the entire community of the, the community of Cabanilla managed to intercept, to seize uh, the viceroy himself and present their complaints on, their, uh, on his hands. The community has, was resisting a long battle against the local colonial officials and some criollos uh, to defend from this possession of their lands and their community possessions. Paricagua had been the cacique's assistant before and organized his community to take the complaint to Hager courts outside his, uh, this, uh, their jurisdiction. In reality, the legal battle of the, the Cabanilla community had begun 
1690 by their own cacique at that time. 100 years later in 1806, the community must continue the fight. Parikawa heard that the viceroy himself was going to pass by the royal uh, road near their community. And he organized the community to go to, to the, the road and wait for, for him, for the viceroy to pass and then uh, present their documents. Traveling secretly, dur secretly during the night, the entire community of Tikiyaka, women, men, and children, hid along the royal road and there they waited for days until the viceroy and his entourage appeared. In a following document in the, in the case, later they wrote, hemos ocurrido a esperarlo a medio camino de tránsito a la ciudad de Arequipa. We have uh, come to wait for the viceroy and half the way to the city of Arequipa. Indeed, Fernando de Abascal, the newly appointed viceroy of Peru, was traveling from the high, through the highlands in mid-1806 from Buenos Aires to Lima to be installed in his office. The sudden appearance of a large group of community members requesting an audience uh, of him in the very road must have been a shock for him and, uh, and the people around him. The community was allowed to approach and as uh, they wrote in his documents, con los documentos necesarios, les presentamos a su excelentísimo uh, señor virrey de Lima que pasó por estos lugares. We personally presented our, our case and documents on the hands of the, uh, its excellency who passed by our, our roads, so, the road Parikawa. In a third case, the community of Cabanilla was not the only one who uh, heard about the viceroy passing by the region of the Andes. The Tikiyaka community also managed to place their complaint on the very hands of viceroy. Eugenio Quispe, Pedro Hilari, these are uh, uh, common uh, community members and the entire community declared in a letter later on when we had the happiness that your excellency passed to those places to take command of his viceroyalty, we made it clear to you in consortium with the entire community, the great injustices we suffered from our cacique, Doña Margarita Tinajero. In a subsequent letter the, to a local judge, Parikawa wrote again on my bill, on my behalf and in behalf of my entire community, I have come to inform you that the new intendant governor comes with instructions from the viceroy, whom we have met personally, and he knows about our case. Parikawa, supported by his community, continued a long legal battle in defense of the lands and possessions of his communities, ultimately managed to strip the cacique Tinajero, uh, from her position and appoint a segunda persona as the community leader. In a manner of, uh, of conclusion, across the Altiplano, there is a deeper and more significant process of transformation of politics at community level from cacique led to a more direct horizontal engagement with a diversity of more secondary uh, figures supporting uh, supported by the community as the, uh, the new leaders of the community. This is a deeper level of transformation than the exceptional violent insurrections, and it's evolving during the violent and normal times. This is struggles at the regional level aligned with the larger Lat Lat uh, Andean trend that some historians among which uh, Sinclair Thompson demonstrated in his book entitled, We Alone Will Rule, which examines the collective mobilization, the views that informs them and concludes that indigenous communities in the age of Andean insurrections in the colonial Andes fought for their own visions of self-rule, among uh, many others who wrote uh, similar uh, work are Steve Stern, Sergio Serulnikov, Charles Walker, and others. However, a closer examination of the regional stories tell us that it is the struggle from below 
about community resources, organization of labor and self-rule, a fundamental factor for these Andean insurrections against the colonial order. And it's that that initiates the erosion of the colonial structure. And it's, uh, it starts also the struggles for independence. This is a different narrative from the view that it was primarily enlightened men uh, such as Simon Bolivar and uh, Mar San Martin and other local elites who imagined and fought for the liberation from the colonial powers. This is a closer look to the Altiplano. Other regions like the Southern Cone, uh, parts of Venezuela, Colombia, could give us a lot more insight on the process in the larger uh, Latin America. There is evidence to support that in, it is the conjunction of these unwavering collective mobilizations and litigation of communities in the Altiplano and other regions, the massive insurrections across the Andes that begins to move the rag under the feet of the colonial structure. The legitimizing local authorities, the colonial order to create the Latin American spring for autonomy and self-rule that ultimately produce the birth of independent nations, of which many now are observing their bicentennial. Peru uh, observed the bicentennial in 2021 and Bolivia will do in 2025. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. That was most interesting. Um, <clears throat> so we'd like to open now um, the floor to uh, questions from those of you who are um, are here with us. Um, again, you can just open your mic and, and, and ask your question if you wish, um, or if you prefer, you could enter a question in, um, in the chat. Um, just to, to get things started, um, could you explain a little bit more uh, for those of us that, that are not as, don't understand it quite as well, uh, the traditional structure of authority led by the cacique that you, you, you spoke of, what, what was the position of the cacique? And um, you spoke at one point about secondary leaders and then commoners. Um, could you just explain that social structure of leadership within the indigenous communities a little bit? Sure. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, cacique is where, you know, the... Uh, representatives uh, of the indigenous communities throughout the Andes. The, the, the word, the, the title, of course, is not local. Uh, Curacas was the original uh, name of the ethnic leaders of the communities that precedes even the Inca period. Uh, caciques or Curacas uh, were in place where the uh, community chiefs uh, and indeed, they had religious and uh, political uh, uh, role of the community. And uh, during the colonial period, you know, the colonial structure was able to incorporate caciques, the elite uh, uh, sector of the indigenous communities, as part of the colonial structures. They, they became colonial agents. Mm -hmm. They receive a, a salary, a monthly salary, and, uh, and uh, in exchange for their uh, role to organize the collection of tribute, organization of labor, uh, and such. Uh, but that that is, you know, it was a complex process. Many, uh, it was different from place to place. But in general, uh, the uh, cacique was the representative of the community. He spoke uh, on behalf of the community. He represented the community. He traveled to uh, a regional and a larger uh, Latin America, Andean re uh, uh, regional level, even brought their cases all the way to the peninsula of Spain and presented in the higher court in, in the hands of the, of the king their uh, complaints about uh, you know, uh, perceived abuses from local colonial authorities. So the uh, cacique is from being the ethnic lords uh, uh, representing, defending, and providing protection for the local communities. During the colonial period, they uh, are transformed and uh, become part of the colonial structure. 
which the community towards the end of the colonial period and late colonial period, the community is, uh, recognizes that process and identify the community the cacique is, as being one more of the, the, their enemies to defend their collective uh, possessions, lands and labor from them. Mm -hmm. And just to follow up a little bit, so the, you, you are also contrasting these um, movements that use the court system to protest against abuses with the better known uh, violent uprisings. Um, were the leaders of those violent uprisings also caciques or were they also uh, anti-cacique? What, what, what was their role? the the larger movements the most the the most known uh, uh, uprisings like uh, i mentioned uh, you know tomas catari in the region of bolivia tupac amaro in the region of the andes of peru were not traditional caciques tomas catari was a, a common indian uh, in the language of the time mm -hmm. uh, that s started a movement uh, against the local uh, colonial authorities perceived as being abusive and, uh, uh, you know, in, in different ways, not only extracting tribute, but you abusing the, the forms of uh, organization of labor for the, for the communities. Uh, Tupac Amaru himself, although he uh, acted as a cacique of, of their uh, region, uh, it was resented by uh, other caciques of uh, of greater nobility, right? The caciques were ex these exchange figures were in the contact zone between the colonial government and the community, and they presented themselves from very from very early in the colonial period of, of uh, Spanish America as the the nobility of the uh, Indian sector in in the Andes. They never called themselves Indians, for instance. They wow. called the community members Indians, but they, they separated themselves from there saying that we are the, a cacique lineage by blood and we inherit the, our, our offices in that way. Very uh, similar to how the Spanish crown uh, functioned as well. Yeah. So the, these, uh, the revolts were not traditional caciques, mm -hmm. uh, and they uh, led those those uh, uprisings. However, they, in the more normal, quote unquote, normal times, the larger community at the base, you know, engaged in uh, in mobilizations to present their their cases before local and regional. Uh, judges and uh, court system using the the very same uh, colonial legal system who was uh, put in place to control them and turn it around to defend themselves and, and reduce the amount of pressure they were receiving. And they were quite successful in many, many cases. Hmm. Um, Dr. Faisan, I see your camera on. Did you, did you have a, a question? I actually do. Thank you, Victoria. This was really fascinating. And I hope we can have lunch sometime so that I can bend your ear about uh, some parallels with 19th century Japan, which would be odd, undoubtedly, because it wasn't a colonial situation. But my question does come from this comparison. Um, I'm going to try not to lecture too much on Japanese history as I ask it. Um, <laughs> It, it has to do with a parallel between a certain kind of village elite in Japanese communities that seem to line up to a degree with uh, caciques in the case of the Andes. Um, and the kinds of analysis that's been done about this, this local elite in Japan as it was going through a revolutionary moment, the, the Meiji Restoration, is that there was, and this is, so this is my question, is, is, is what, what, what we have observed in the Japanese case is that there is pressure on that um, cacique analogous group from below, from the communities that they're representing, and of course, from above, from the powers that, you know, they're not the, they're not the overwhelming, you know, in this case, they're not the Spanish authorities. In the case of Japan, they're not part of the samurai elite. And 
there are really significant shifts in their allegiances that have a great impact on uh, first the, the revolution, but then what happens after the revolution takes place as their um, interests kind of shift with the new regime. And I'm not necessarily asking you to talk about the post-revolutionary Latin America, but I am curious to know if, you know, the, the two case studies that you gave us both were about instances where the local indigenous community is struggling against the, the cacique as sort of the local elite. Um, and I'm wondering if there are cases where the cacique all, uh, may have at times for certain very contextual reasons sided with those local communities against the Spanish and then maybe at other times shifted. Like, is there, is it always consistent in the way that your two cases might indicate? Yes, yes, Th and thank you for, for the, the comparison. And I think it's, it's always fascinating to see processes similar. I, I do some comparison with the uh, change uh, from the transition from colonial period to post-colonial period in India as well, which is a uh, hundred years apart. Have, uh, with the Andes, but that's the other thing I was thinking about. Process. Yeah, in terms yeah. of those kinds of elites. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. So, in in the case of the Andes, yes, there is. It is different from place to place, but the the tendency in different uh, 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 at the larger level is that uh, different to the traditional uh, understanding by uh, other historians that uh, elite sectors in the colonial uh, 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 structure, the Creole elites from local Creole elites fight against the colonial power to change the dynamics and they become the, uh, the leaders uh, pushing out the Spanish uh, power uh, and the Spanish elites. It's not quite the process. In, uh, in uh, what we see more in this uh, closer look to regional cases is how much of the uh, local communities intervention uh, on based on their uh, local uh, in the local effects of uh, defending their community possessions, their individual possessions, and differentiating the 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 office of the cacique that they towards the, uh, the late colonial period, the communities recognized that the office of the cacique, not just the person, the office of the cacique has been completely uh, uh, changed, corrupted as they say, corrompido as they say, and they have uh, you know, become an office, uh, an employment for, for many, uh, it has become a uh, uh, post that were lesser uh, Spaniards or elite sectors of lesser status were appointed, not only as it was in the, uh, in the earlier colonial period, the lineage of the cacique family uh, inherited the, the office, but uh, towards the end of the colonial period, that changes. Uh, and the colonial authorities appoint is oftentimes any person from the community who is uh, interested, willing to take the job of, uh, you know, organizing the collection of tribute, supporting the local uh, magistrates to uh, get revenue of their business, their uh, distributing uh, goods and to exorbitant prices, and, you know, organize the labor of the communities to the mines. Uh, that you know that is that tendency is, is strong uh, across the Andes. That is, it is local communities at the base level stepping in and uh, you know uh, really uh, delegitimizing the office of the cacique and then uh, bringing in other figures that are uh, the secondary figures who were some of them are previous. Uh, assistance of the caciques, or uh, some of them, the, the other figure that existed in the in the colonial period in the uh, in the Spanish America was also the alcaldes, the mayor, the local mayors that the Spanish system imposed on 
in order to replace the cacique that that didn't quite work throughout the colonial period they maintained alcaldes or in indian mayors but that office was always a secondary or tertiary figure uh, compared to the cacique so the, that process is ongoing and the communities uh, participate more directly in in politics they, co they complain about the local uh, authorities, but also their, their ideals, uh, the ideas discussed as, you know, we can govern ourselves uh, at the community level, at the regional level, they join forces uh, uh, across the Andes uh, between different communities. Communities themselves, and the, the semi, many scholars have worked on, on the economic part of this process, how communities have come up with the uh, source of funding to support the uh, legal cases uh, going to the courts because that was expensive to, to send uh, groups of people traveling you know, from the part of the Lake Titicaca area to La Paz, which in the map looks uh, short, but it was a uh, uh, two, three days journey one way uh, and another two, three in the back and going to the, the vice royalty, the, the uh, court, the main courts in Buenos Aires or Lima on the other side, it was quite a, a journey that needed to uh, be supported economically by the community. And the communities were able to come up with uh, contributions as well and specific funding to maintain those efforts at the community level, rather than just let a, what was before the cacique having uh, the direct support from the community and using community resources to do that. Thank you. Thank Does you for the question. I have a question. I, ha I have more, but I'd like to give other people the opportunity if you have some. Um, I I'll go ahead with, with one, uh, Victor. The, the idea that these communities would put so much effort and so, go to so much expense to present a judicial case indicates that they had some hope that the judiciary would find in their favor, that it would matter. Um, did that bear out? Did, did the judicial authorities side with the communities um, or were these efforts almost always frustrated? And, and if so, if they're always frustrated, do you know why the communities went to such effort to do that? <clears throat> uh, that's a great question, Charles. And I, I think as, as it happens in most of uh, histories of uh, you know, uh, struggles to liberate from uh, uh, controlling powers, it's bittersweet. Yeah. It, uh, it has been uh, successful in many, many cases. Uh -huh. But it's been also tremendously manipulated uh, by the local powers, or what mm -hmm. Stephen Stern, a professor of uh, history uh, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, had called the, by the power groups. Right, the, the local powers were the the Spanish magistrate and uh, of a region, the the cura, the priest, and the cacique. Those are the triangle of power in each region. They oftentimes fought between themselves, mm -hmm. competed for, for uh, supremacy uh, uh, between themselves, and sometimes they allied. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the communities could not go anywhere uh, when the, the three were uh, together. Uh -huh. So what the, however, what they, what this Spanish uh, legal system uh, allowed them to do is also, is very interesting, the local powers had you know certain jurisdiction there were higher courts above them mm -hmm. and they were always at odds the higher uh, judges in the vice royal courts wanted to place their their people of uh, the closest to them in those lower uh, you know positions as well so they were always looking uh, for uh, excuses to uh, try to investigate and accuse the uh, people in the, the lower offices. So communities played that role, the, and they understood how that worked, that dynamic work, uh, worked. So they that's what they did. The uh, clandestine uh, travels, you know, for for weeks 
two or three uh-huh. weeks journey from, from the high Andes, from the Altiplano A all the way to the Viceroyal Court in Lima, mm-hmm. just to uh, present documented uh, evidence of how uh, the local uh, colonial authorities be, were abusing the preferred subjects of the king, right? They, they used the language that the king himself used uh, referring to his subjects, uh, you know, a benevolent king, respecting the subject, protecting the subject. They used that play, same language into the same legal system mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, appear before the higher court and say, these, uh, you know, co- local colonial authorities are against the king himself. Uh-huh. Uh, and so the higher court authorities oftentimes uh, acted and ordered investigations and change of local uh, elites, uh, caciques, corregidores. But however, you know, the higher courts were busy with thousands of cases coming from all over the place, as you know. Uh, and uh, the other thing was that, uh, as all most administrations do, they they usually. Uh, appointed a, uh, a commission, a committee mm-hmm. to go and investigate. Mm-hmm. And, the, and that group of people, usually you know, a group of two or three who will travel to these far flanks of the, uh, of the region to interview those accused, were in the process uh, bought you know, uh, corrupted, received money and or twisted or, or some some people died in the process. So, the, you know, that delayed and uh, or oftentimes the, the lost documents got lost and things like that. Mm. And, uh, and uh, you know, that complicated. But uh, uh, many times the communities were successful in their cases, mm-hmm. uh, particularly because they had good connections with uh uh, with some uh, scribes and uh, uh, lawyers, uh, attorneys in the around the uh, the courts, and the, why why was important to have as in, you know uh, emerging new uh, figures uh, leaders for the community, this mm-hmm. assistant of the cacique or other secondary figures was also because the language. Mm-hmm. Communities spoke in their native languages. Mm-hmm. In the court, you needed to present everything in Spanish. Yeah. But the, uh, the, the secondary figures, because they worked for, for uh, no, many for a long time with the cacique or caciques, they were bilingual too. Mm-hmm. And plus, they knew who to go to in the colonial center to receive uh, not only you know, room and board uh, where a place to stay, but also uh, the right contact with the lawyers and, uh, and aid and uh, legal aids in different levels. Mm. That's very interesting. Well, one, one last question, although again, if anyone else has a question, I'd really like to hear it, but I, I'll ask one last question. And this uh, comes just, I, I know that you are professionally an historian, but you are also a student of contemporary social movements in, in the Southern Andes. You, this is something you've studied and know about. And I was wondering what this study of the independence period, what kind of light that might shed on what you see in contemporary social movements. Do you see any similarities to these dynamics or it not being a colonial situation as it was? Is it just really these are different worlds and, and these patterns don't repeat very much? How, how would you respond to that? Thank you, Charles. This is a second lecture, right? The, for the next <laughs> an hour or so. <laughs> we'll invite you back. We'll invite you. <laughs> well, I'll you take give us an introduction please. today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, that that's the reason why I became historian. I, in my uh, uh, training before in undergrad and uh, master's degree was in sociology, social science, and I study the conf- conflicting relationship within the popular indigenous sectors with the elite sectors in, in the Andes. Yeah, yeah. And because I wanted to un- understand a little bit more uh, what you just asked, 
Ah, okay. It's why I decided to become a historian to see ah. the larger view and say, where is this coming from? Where where is the moment where with uh, you know we can see that things uh, started to shape in the way that we see now, uh, you know, in in twenty twenty two or around. And it's that uh, you know my the, my interest on the transition period from colonial to uh, post colonial. I think it's key that that precisely the, the the separation between the indigenous and popular sectors view of autonomy and the perceptions of uh, access and management of their uh, collective. Uh, possessions, lands, labor, differed completely with the elite sector that wanted to just have power and extract uh, benefits from the from the indigenous communities. That it seems to me, in many ways, continues in in different forms uh, in the next two centuries. Uh-huh. Indigenous communities in the in the highlands continue to perceive. And to this day, they continue to maintain, for instance, the, the local legal system. Mm-hmm. Civil cases, communities handle them mm-hmm. uh, at local community levels. They, they have their, uh, what they call, you know, the community security system or como, uh, the Ronda Campesinas from which mm-hmm. the current president of Peru uh, comes from, for instance. Uh, they they maintain that level of uh, you know the, the organization, the political organization at the community level. It's not officially recognized and uh, dictated by the national government, mm-hmm. but it is assumed and and protected to work that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, the same with the uh, uh, organization and management of. Uh, some of the uh, natural resources, the access to water, forest, uh, and community lands continue to, they continue to have jurisdiction to control that alongside with the uh, government uh, agencies that also uh, play a role on distribution and management of of the resources like water, land, and others. Uh, So that uh, has been uh, I think you know, uh, uh, controlled and uh, and exercised uh, control by the communities mm-hmm. at the local and even regional levels, mm-hmm. and the conflicts with the national government continues because of when who makes the decision for larger extractive industries, for instance, oil uh, mining operations yeah. that should be consulted to the local communities, uh, but are not not always. And that continues to be a problem for the communities who uh, see the effects of those activities in, uh, in their everyday life. Well, that's very interesting. And that, that would be a good topic for another talk. Uh, <laughs> so we may, we may move on to that. Um, is there anyone else who would like to ask a question before we wrap up here? Just real quick. Well, let me thank you all for, for having come this afternoon and, and shared your time with us. We know everyone's time is valuable, and uh, we hope that this has been an experience uh, where we've all, I've certainly learned a number of interesting things, and I hope everyone else here um, has uh, learned from this most interesting and, and clear, I think, very clear presentation. Um, I would like to let you know that the last uh, seminar for the uh, Center for the Americas this semester is going to be held two weeks from today at the same time. Um, And Professor Kalenda Eaton from the African and African American Studies program is going to be speaking about one of the uh, countries in the Americas, but not Latin America. This is an English speaking uh, part of the world. And so we're looking at Belize. And uh, she's going to be speaking about the politics of tourism and culture in Belize, a country that she has studied intimately. Um, So please uh, join me uh, via Zoom on uh, Friday, April 8th at 3 p.m. to learn from Professor Glenda Eaton. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mackey. We've we've really enjoyed uh, your presence and what we've learned from you. Uh, And um, 
thank you to uh, Stephanie again for helping set this up and make this work. Um, we appreciate all of your time and uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, Lisa, wonderful to see you and glad to, to uh, have a, a little conversation too.